Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you, there is forgiveness. Since we're gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, saying, God, be merciful to me, sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the Word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the standing by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, we implore you, let your continual pity cleanse and defend your church. And because she cannot continue in safety without your aid, preserve her evermore by your help and goodness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Old Testament for the 15th Sunday after Trinity is written in 1 Kings chapter 17. In those days the word of the Lord came to Elijah, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said. But make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me. And afterward, make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bin of flour shall not be used up, nor the jar of oil run dry, until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. This is the word of the Lord. Epistle is written in Galatians 5 and 6. Brethren, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also become tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For each one will have to bear his own load. Let him who has taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will also of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. This is the word of the Lord.
continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the sixth chapter. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. This is the gospel of the Lord. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. And was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father in heaven and from Jesus Christ our Lord. Beloved saints in Christ, all of the scriptures point to Jesus. This is true. Because of that, as Jesus teaches and preaches, although often not directly quoting the Old Testament, he will use those texts and images from those texts subtly sometimes to make his point. And the more you go back and read those texts, you will see how deeply rooted in them he actually is. So as he teaches, he will draw people back into the Old Testament using these images and reveal who he is through them. We see this today as Jesus seemingly just makes a pass talking about King Solomon. The more we get into his life, we see that he's making a much deeper point. Jesus today is teaching about anxiousness and trying to serve two masters. So going back into the Old Testament, the days of King David... In the end of his life, as David lay dying, his son Adonijah wanted to set himself up as king. But despite his best efforts, it was Solomon who was anointed king. Solomon would carry the promise of the Messiah. Solomon began his reign with much faith and much zeal. Everything was moving along smoothly. And God appeared to Solomon one night in a dream and asked him to ask anything that he desired. And Solomon said, Give your servant an understanding mind to govern your people that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this, your great people? Imagine God telling you to ask whatever you wanted. To be like Solomon and simply ask for wisdom. Solomon could have asked for anything that would have led him to serve himself. He asked instead to be able to govern God's people. Solomon sought first the kingdom of God. And then God did what God does. He added all other things to him. God said to Solomon, because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind so that None like you has ever been before you, and none like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. And if you walk in my ways, keeping my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. Solomon sought first the kingdom of God, and then all the other things were added unto him. You can see what Jesus is doing here in Matthew chapter 6 simply by mentioning the name of Solomon and all his splendor and glory. Solomon would soon turn away from that very word of God which was the source of his wisdom. He turned away from wisdom toward the way of foolishness as he began to enter into marriage alliances with neighboring tribes and nations, marrying kings, daughters from all around, one after the other. And in this point in history, the world would look at Solomon and his kingdom, and they would see a a thriving, growing, prosperous kingdom, a kingdom growing territorially and economically. But the world doesn't see the heart of Solomon. As he would turn and build high places, he would build temples to the gods of his 700 wives. 
Instead of relying solely on the one true God, he turned to their gods, sacrificing to them. And this would not only cause Solomon's downfall, but the downfall of God's united kingdom as it was split in two after Solomon's death. Jesus' example of Solomon is a perfect one in talking about splendor and majesty, but even more perfect in talking about serving two masters and anxiousness. Look what happened in Solomon's life. He had everything anyone could ever desire, but in the end, he was trying to serve two masters. The first was obvious. He was serving after the one true God. He built the temple that would stand for hundreds of years. But he also tried to serve his 700 wives and their desires as he built temples to their gods. In trying to serve two masters, the kingdom would fall. Jesus tells us today that we cannot serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be loyal to the one and despise the other. And he speaks this way concerning money and possessions. But isn't it true that whatever other things we try to serve are those things which lead to the epidemic of anxiousness that we see today? Look how much anxiety exists in our world and in your own lives. People are anxious about everything. Bills, health, government. We don't have to go on with the list. You know what these things are, and the news is very good at keeping these things right in your face. But look at where anxiousness leads. Fear. Anger. And the fear and the anger then gives way to withdrawal. Trying to remove yourself from all of these things which drive this anxiety. And then there's death. With none to save. Jesus, though, today speaks specifically about money. And it's easy to see how money leads to anxiousness. The world, though, is of a different opinion. The world says that money leads to happiness. The more money you have, the more things you have, and the happier you'll be. But what a slippery slope that is. Because the more money you have, the more things you you buy, and that leads to having to keep up with all of those things that you have. More money needs to be spent to keep up with those things. Where is that money going to come from? And of course, you look around and you see that it's never enough, is it? Never enough to keep up with all of those around you. Somebody always is going to have newer. Somebody else is always going to have better And rather than recognizing this and stepping out of that vicious cycle, we give in to it. And we work more so we can buy more. Less time for family. Less time for friends. Less time for God. And that's really what happens, isn't it? All of these anxiety producers leads to the church being left out. And I know we're still a month away from our stewardship campaign, but here we have the text right in our face today. I don't know who our givers are in the church, and I don't know how much those givers give, but I do know that we have very faithful givers. Cheerful givers, as the Bible encourages us to be, and we're very grateful for you. In the same way I don't know who gives and what they give, I don't know who doesn't give. But the fact remains that, much like every other church, it doesn't matter what denomination, many people don't give at all. 
And that is the same here. Something 40% or more, don't give any. And in times of budgeting and times of shortfall, the meetings always go the same way. It's, we need to cut this and we need to cut that. Rarely does the discussion ever go toward repentance and talk about serving God, seeking first the kingdom rather than our own desires. Christ our Lord is true. You cannot serve God in money. Consider the life of Jesus. This was the object, this was the objective of his enemies. They wanted him to serve two masters because if he would serve two masters, he would fall. The devil tried immediately in the wilderness, all this will be yours if you will fall down and worship me. The Pharisees, what sign will you give us? They tried relentlessly all the way to the end as Jesus was even bound to the cross, helpless and dying. If you are the Son of God, come down now from the cross. He saved others. He can't save himself. But instead of serving two, very much unlike Solomon, Jesus served one. He fulfilled the will of his Father. And he breathed his last and died. And when all looked like chaos, when all looked like it was unknown very much, like with the death of David, Jesus didn't need to wait for a descendant to take the throne. He is the true son of David, the true king to come. And he rose from the dead his is the kingdom we seek after because His is not a kingdom of anxiousness and fear and anger and death. His is a kingdom of life. A kingdom of the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. And in seeking first this kingdom, His kingdom, all of the other things will be added unto you. And those are the best things not a better job, better car, bigger house. His aren't the things of the world. His are the riches and honor from God. Forgiveness, life, and salvation. For Jesus tells us that even the flowers of the field are arrayed more beautifully than Solomon. Flowers. Nothing according to the world but beauty in the eyes of God. Have a serious look at the anxiousness in your own life. And as you look at that, consider the source. It's not a mirror any of us like to look into. Do you know the truth? And when you do recognize the source of that anxiousness, you'll see the truth in Jesus' words for you today. If you continue to try to serve two masters, your house will be divided as it was after the death of Solomon, and you will fall. But in seeking first the kingdom of God, you may not be arrayed like the rest of the world, but as was promised with Solomon, Long life will be added unto you, for it is life everlasting, and oh, how splendidly arrayed it will be. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs.
Merciful God, we humbly implore you to cast the bright beams of your light upon your church, that we may walk in the light of your truth and finally attain to the light of everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty and everlasting God, you desire not the death of a sinner, but that all would repent and live. Hear our prayers for those outside the church and the enemies of your church, that they would turn from their iniquity and be brought into the communion of saints, that the body might be strengthened and live in peace for the glory of your name. Lord, in your mercy. God, look in favor upon Deaconess Phillips, Mr. Moody, our fifth and sixth grade classes, Pastor Gaub, our other teachers and students, and all who entrust them to our care, that we might be a light of your truth to them at all times. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Father in heaven, you have reconciled the world to yourself through the birth of a child. We ask that you keep Esther and Christy and their unborn children safely in your care. Prepare them and also Bradley and Ben to fulfill their vocations according to your will. Lord, in your mercy. Father of mercies and God of all comfort, look favorably upon the sick and dying, those recovering or in affliction, the lonely and those bereaved, especially Marge, Billy, Chris, Angel, Nancy, Marge, Anne, Sheila, Suzanne, Christina, Joe, Terry, Gail, Steve, Carol, Charlotte, Mary, Mildred, Jamie, Betty, James, Susan, David, Susie, Rachel, Karen, JP, Sharonda, Linda, and Johnny. Assure them of your mercy, deliver them from the temptations of the evil one, and give them patience and comfort in these times, delivering them if it be in accord with your gracious will. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. 